We begin with two quick updates on officers injured today while out protecting the rest of us. The Denver police officer hit by a car while riding a motorcycle today near the Pepsi Center is expected to be okay and Spear Boulevard's back open. Jeffco Sheriff's deputy literally was able to walk away from a crash on Highway 6 in Golden today. Five cars got tangled up there. Deputy went to the hospital as a precaution. No one else was hurt. Bipartisan is not a synonym for unanimous. The landmark plan to raise sales taxes to pay for highway projects across our state is being celebrated this week as a bipartisan project. And it's true, the Democratic House Speaker and the Republican Senate President stood shoulder to shoulder on it. But there are Republicans who tell our politics guy, Brandon Ritterman, that they got elbowed away from the negotiating table. Chris Holbert is the Senate Majority Leader. His office is right next to Senate President Kevin Grantham because he's second in command. You might expect him to be in the know on a big compromise bill, but... Senator Holbert, when did you find out about this plan? Uh, before the press conference on the bill. Uh, so, so you found out day of, is that what you're saying? Uh, the day prior. Sitting aside him, House Minority Leader Patrick Neville says he wasn't consulted at all. In a statement, he said as a result, supporters can expect House Republicans to push back. And that as a result bit is what leads me to ask, are you opposing this because you've got a better idea, or are you opposing it because you're upset that you were left out of the negotiation? Well, I think that members in our caucus are extremely upset. I've talked to every single member, and I don't think one was even involved in these discussions. Um, but beyond that, it's just awful policy. These Republicans feel like new taxes are at best premature without big budget cuts first. Neville has a theory about this deal that's pretty sinister. The other side of the aisle has been holding our commute hostage so that they could try to get a tax increase. You, you honestly think Democrats view this as a means to an end to get a tax increase versus a tax increase is just an easier way to do it? I think that they've punted on some of the several bills we've had, like the trans bonds bills that we've run the past three years, we're running another one this year. They haven't liked that idea because they want to hold out for a tax increase. So again, you, th you think that this is, they're not going to go for any other way just because they want to increase taxes? Correct. Motives aside, it sounds like the deal the Senate President and House Speaker pounded out may have competition soon. I would be surprised if we don't see at least one other proposal. Um, then we that also may or may not have your name on it. <laughs> I, I'm not on the transportation committee, okay. but I was going to end this with a cliche like this deal has a long road ahead, but I'm pretty sure you gathered that by now. So for next, I'm Brandon Rudiman. Joe Salazar is not running for governor. He would probably prefer our headline tonight be that he announced today that he is running for attorney general. But the state rep from Thornton could have been a real thorn in the side of establishment Democrats if he had decided to go for Gov instead. Salazar is a Bernie Sanders type of guy, and he's promising to directly take on President Trump if he can beat incumbent Republican State Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman. Boulder County District Attorney Stan Garnett, another Democrat, has also filed to run for AG. He told us he hasn't decided for sure on the race but wanted to get the paperwork in order. He ran for that post and lost in 2010. Colorado's leaders are shouting on top of a mountain of marijuana tax revenue, employing the Trump administration to leave legal marijuana alone. The administration has sent conflicting signals on whether it's going to enforce federal laws against marijuana. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock tells me he's been convinced that legal recreational marijuana is a benefit to our city. The people of Colorado have spoken. The people of many other states have spoken, I think what, 34 now, have spoken about the, the desire to legalize medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. It would behoove the federal government uh, to put in systems to kind of allow for the system uh, to move forward. And this comes from a guy who opposed it initially. You're among a number of elected leaders in Colorado who were initially hesitant about it mm -hmm. and are now defending mm -hmm. our system. One could look at that and say, here are pragmatic politicians that are willing to give the people what they want and implement the best system, or you could look at it and say, anything for a buck, and there's a <laughs> lot of bucks tied to legal marijuana. Sure. It's more than a money thing. Absolutely. You can research my statements when I pose it. Not all tax revenue is good tax revenue. Uh, it was never about money for, for me. The reality is this is about a system that the people have said they want. And they have spoken loudly and clearly here in Denver and in the state of Colorado. Um, and now my, my constitutional responsibility is to implement that, um, that policy in a very responsible manner, which we've done. And I'm proud of this city. I'm proud of the state of Colorado. And I'm proud of the industry, quite frankly, who've done a good job in partnering. Had it not been for their willingness to cooperate and collaborate in setting up the regulatory and enforcement framework, I don't think we'd be here today talking about the way we have. 
but they've been very responsible and accountable. They are men and women, just like you and I, who have put their hard-earned money, many of them put their retirement money up to do this, and it's working for them. And they've been responsible. They don't want to go bad any more than you and I do. And so, again, I think it would behoove the federal government to find a way, how do we help be a partner with the cities and the states to make this a very responsible system. Governor John Hickenlooper is another who is fond of saying that he's seen the light on legal pot after initial opposition. California passed legal marijuana and then called on our governor to give some advice to its legislators. President Trump, when he was candidate Trump running, on a number of occasions, he said, well, this is kind of something that different states are trying, and maybe we should just wait and see how it plays out. Uh, obviously, the new attorney general has a different perspective and has been vocal in saying that he thinks it's a bad experiment, shouldn't go forward. Colorado's experiment continues to bubble along in this laboratory of democracy, as the cool kids say. There are several cannabis bills. They're chugging along at the state capitol this year. Some would strengthen enforcement, and you have to think the Trump administration would look kindly on those. Others would give marijuana more reach, like into pot clubs and with pot delivery. The governor wouldn't tell us this week if he would veto those expanded marijuana ventures, but he did send a pretty strong signal. I do think given the uncertainty in Washington, that this is not the time, this isn't the year to be out reaching for trying to carve off new turf uh, and expand markets and make dramatic statements about marijuana. Uh, I mean, the federal government can take, you know, can, have, can yield a pretty heavy hand. And that is a TBD at this point. The Trump administration is in the process of reshaping the Justice Department, which would prosecute pot. Today alone, Attorney General Jeff Sessions asked for the resignations of 46 U.S. attorneys, not Colorado's, because ours is only here in an acting capacity, so the administration is going to pick a permanent top prosecutor for Colorado anyway. Hey, for a moment, back to Mayor Hancock. This week, as we've talked about his plans to collaborate and clash with the Trump administration, a few of you have been more interested in the model airplanes that sit on his desk. The mayor's head is closest to an Emirates Plane. That's a gift from the company after a meeting. Mayor's trying to secure a direct flight from Denver to Dubai. And the other plane there, the one with the blue and yellow tail, that's from Lufthansa Airlines, a gift signifying Denver's direct flight to Munich, Germany. May I make a recommendation? Point you towards something that did not come from us but is absolutely worth your time. If you're into podcasts, and if you're not into podcasts, you should be, and we'll discuss that on a different day. But you should check out the Decode DC podcast called I'm a Reformed Lobbyist, Ask Me Anything. Jimmy Williams, the host, is a former lobbyist and Capitol Hill staffer. He pulls back the curtain on how lobbying really works behind the scenes, like what happens behind closed doors. He has a really disarming way of talking about the guts of politics. Now, Decode DC is owned by a company that also owns one of our TV competitors in town, so I don't know if my boss is going to like this recommendation, but I think you should listen to Decode DC. You can find a link on the next Facebook page. A dusty old painting found in an attic begins a search for a family that's missing a bit of its history. It just says a lot for a hero that needs to be found. St. Patrick's Day, beyond the pint. My boss has some thoughts on what it really means to be Irish, or to be anything, really. Your votes today determine which crime against fashion will be committed later. And this video shows you exactly what not to do if a moose wants to race down a ski slope. Next. That is a moose. That is a moose racing down a ski slope at Breck. That is a moose racing down a ski slope at Breck while a woman on skis takes out her phone to videotape the moose rather than to get the hell away from a clearly agitated and very dangerous animal. Colorado Parks and Wildlife would like you to please, please not do what this woman is doing, ever. They would like to remind you that moose are among the most dangerous animals in Colorado. They are territorial, they are defensive, they are heavy, and they give zero you-know-whats about your personal safety. Breck says these moose spottings do happen. If you see one on the ski slopes, move in another direction. Do not race parallel with it. Get behind something like a tree or another obstacle in case the dis moose decides to head straight for you.
Unbelievable. You never know what's coming our way here in Colorado. My goodness, I'd be freaked out, wouldn't you? Nice to see some snowfall up in the high country, certainly around the metro area. Tough to see any. It's been 10 days since we've had measurable rain or snow, at least here in the city, but that all changes as we head toward the weekend. Yes, the weekend is finally here and so far so good. A nice little cool off coming in tomorrow. Temperatures in the mid 50s early tomorrow morning, possibly a few rain showers across the city, a little bit of snowfall if you live to the south and also to the east too. Then Sunday arrives. We'll crank up the dial just a bit, but we'll also usher in those pesky winds that have been with us for really the past week or so. Another chance at seeing just a little bit of light precipitation. Again, this isn't going to be a huge monster storm by any means, but we'll take what we can get tonight. 10 PM. There's that front digging in from the north. There comes the rain by early tomorrow morning. If you're an early bird, you might find some of these showers, but if you like to sleep in on the weekends, it's going to be gone before you know it. I think between about 10 AM and noon, this storm long gone by about five. We're going to be looking at those clear skies. 10 PM clear skies taking over Sunday again, a little bit warmer, might find a few showers in the late afternoon, early evening, and then we're into the 60s Monday, Tuesday. Steve bring on the 70s. They'll be here by Wednesday. Thanks, Danielle. Maybe you can recognize a face. Maybe you could reunite a family with a piece of its history, something that was found in a dusty attic in Fort Collins. The back room was totally remodeled. We're updating it to make it a place for the younger guys. In an effort to vamp up VFW post-1781 for the future, Commander Don May, if this doesn't test your nerves, nothing will. Found a piece of the past. It was back in the back in here. Stacked. It was this. It was up there so long it was covered in dust. So no one knows where the portrait came from, how long it's been there, who put it up there or anything. What's more, no one knows who this was. There's some handwriting on the back of it. His first name is Delmar. His last name was Bonham. He was in the Army Air Corps. He was on a bomber crew. The members of the post have figured a few things out. He was a POW from January of 44 to May of 45, liberated by the Russians. Then he apparently joined this post. But beyond that, the trail has gone cold. We've done what we can to try to locate the gentleman's family to at least get his portrait back to his grandchildren or great-grandchildren. But that doesn't mean the trail stops there. Well, if it was your grandfather or great-grandfather, wouldn't you want to know? I would. For now, First Lieutenant Bonham will have a place above the POW table. Somebody's got to care. We want to find them. The vet's here, living out that motto at the bottom of that flag. He's a hero. This is a place for remembering. First Lieutenant Bonham died in 1983. His last known place of residence was Bellevue in Larimer County. If you know how to contact his family, get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. And they asked around to see if anyone in the post remembers him. Yep. They don't. Nothing. I mean, it was more than 30 years ago that he passed away. So you can imagine some of the vets are new in there. Sure. Uh, they're just looking for any clue they could possibly get. And then if they find the family, they are going to make a copy of that photo and keep it on the wall. In the They'll keep the copy. Yeah. Family gets the original. Family gets the original. We hope this gets spread far and wide because certainly generation later, people could have moved away and whatever else. Absolutely. He said somebody's got to care. We hope that's the case. Thank you, Steve. Each year, drunk driving arrests collect a population of Coloradans that could fill every house in Golden. That and some personal thoughts about the impacts of the hammered holiday so many of our neighbors plan to have. And no week around here will ever end without your good news. Next. Perhaps you remember our boss, the guy who can name all the presidents in order along with the years they served, made an appearance on Next recently. He also happens to be a touch obsessed with his Irish heritage. Since the big parade is Saturday morning and the holiday itself is one week from today, our Tim Ryan would like just a moment of your time to talk about St. Patrick's Day. You've probably heard a version of the saying, everyone's Irish on St. Patrick's Day which is often used as a reason to drink as much as humanly possible in one day. Not that there's anything wrong with drinking, maybe just not as much as humanly possible in one day. However, I really am Irish, even though I somehow can't stand the taste of beer. Go figure. Sorry, Kyle. On my desk at work, I keep a picture of my great-grandfather, Dennis Ryan, who immigrated from Ireland at the age of 12 in 1844. 
It should go without saying, he isn't 12 in this picture, but you get the idea. The point is, I'm proud to be Irish. My daughters were both Irish dancers when they were younger, and I loved watching them display an important Irish cultural practice. But this brings me to a serious point. Although I think of myself as Irish American, I've learned over time to appreciate other cultures because our differences make life interesting. I'm personally fascinated by Native American culture, even though to my knowledge I have no Native American ancestry. That story is one of beauty, complexity, and tragedy, and one that everyone should work hard to understand because it's part of the American story. Just like the story of Hispanic people who settled in Colorado before English-speaking Americans even got close, or black buffalo soldiers who protected Colorado in the 1800s. Cultural differences cause a lot of trouble. History is filled with examples of the terrible way human beings treat each other because of what can generally be described as our tribal instincts. Now, this isn't a good thing, but it's true and very powerful, which is why I don't mind that everyone's Irish on St. Patrick's Day. We should all just work harder to understand each other on all the other days of the year. At least, that's what Katie the Irish Chihuahua and I think, and we're sticking with it. This is Tim, or should I say, Timothy Michael Ryan. If you're curious, Tim is not me or Steve Stager's dad. As Tim said, you might be embracing the idea to drink as much as humanly possible in one day for St. Patrick's Day. And I know that if you've decided to drink yourself into oblivion this weekend, nothing I'm going to say is going to stop you. But I would request that you don't kill me or kill any of your other neighbors. Decide before you go out drinking that driving is just not going to be part of your night. A ride with a sober friend, a cab, light rail, take the A-line. It's never been easier to be a decent human in that regard. CDOT, State Patrol, and local PDs are already out looking for those who can't bother to be decent. Last year, 455 drivers were arrested over the St. Patrick's Day weekend crackdown. 455 drivers who got very lucky because they got caught before they killed someone. We will end this week with a smile, as we always do, your good news. And I'll slip on your choice today of one of my ugliest jackets. It is Friday and we end the work week the same way we always do with your good news. Good news? Yes, there's always good news. There's lots of good news. Yeah, life is definitely positive. Every day I wake up is positive. It's a lovely Friday. Just enjoying this beautiful day that we have right now. Forget about worries, enjoy the sunshine. I've been suffering from jet lag, so I've been waking up at four in the morning and I've had a lot of time to say my prayers. That's pretty good news. <laughs> well, I'm at college now and I've wanted to go since I was 16. I'm 22 now and I'm finally going. <laughs> so that's really cool. It's my first time in the United States of America and I just love Denver. What a beautiful city. It is fantastic. We come from London, where it is so busy and so dirty and so polluted. And to come here, and you're in a city, and you look over to the west and you see the Rockies. Wow, it's amazing. Absolutely fabulous. I just think if you live in Denver, you must be one of the luckiest people in the world. Denver's awesome. So that's quite good news as well, isn't it? We are the luckiest indeed. I'm lucky to have Steve Stager who filled in this week. Ray Best wrote the salmon color jacket should be Kyle's penance for missing those days. It's creamsicle. Brent says, I don't know what other views are seeing. You and Steve don't look like. Tell that to the bartender who handed me Steve's ID the other night. Just saying. See you next time.